Okay, so we're going to be looking at the kingdom of, Is the, of Israel, the ancient kingdom of Israel. Um, that takes us to just uh, before 1000 BC. Um, from here on out, things get a lot more um, abundant proof-wise. I mean, we're going to be able to tie in the entire books of Kings and Chronicles, which is a fantastic thing to be able to say after all the hit and miss stuff that we've been going through with all the diff other areas. But before we get going on the actual proof, which we'll look at, start looking at, I believe, next week, there's a big problem, and that is the, the, the datings of Kings and Chronicles and Samuel. So this is, the, this is the basic idea here, is that the number... The, the reigns of the kings in Kings and Chronicles contradict, contradict each other, and they don't match up with history outside of the Bible. That's that's the problem. Is it seems like um, it's just completely wrong, and there's nothing we can do about it. So because of that, it's caused a lot of people to just throw up their hands and say, "There's nothing you can do about this. It's not really history. Move on." And a lot of even Christians have taken this this kind of view towards it. And rather than trying to work a, work a solution, just kind of letting it go. And if you've spent any time, amount of time talking to people who try to discredit the Bible, this is one of the big things that they'll usually bring up, is that the dates of Kings and Chronicles are just hopelessly confused and lost. <clears throat> and so before we get going on too much, uh, I want to say this. Bef there's a lot of people who have this idea that have put things on blogs and stuff online about how they had different – their years were shorter than ours. That's just not true. Their years were just as long as they are now. It's, nothing's changed. So if you see somebody on a blog that says something like that, they have no idea what they're talking about. They're wrong. Um, ancient peoples were much more advanced than people realize. Um, people knew that the earth was round a long time ago. Way before Columbus, uh, they suspected that uh, the the Earth revolved around the Sun way before what was it uh, Copernicus or not Copernicus um, Kepler, um, you know. So it, it's it, these these ancient people weren't quite as dumb <laughs> as a lot of modern people assume. In fact, um, ancient Iraqians, so Babylonians and that kind of stuff, uh, they uh, they were very advanced. Middle Eastern people just kind of people overlook them as oh they're just hillbillies but who live in the sand or something but no they were actually very intelligent and it's a complete like ugh, just historical atrocity to assume that these people were just backwards it's just not based in reality okay so with that being said we have this huge problem with the chronology of the bible and we would be in a complete loss if it wasn't for the hard work of one of the most important bible scholars to date his name is edwin thiel he single-handedly solved the entire dating problem. And even though his book has been out for 100 years, almost nobody has read it. Now, when I say almost nobody, I don't mean scholarship. Scholarship has read it. Most scholars accept it as the, as the bridge of the gap. It's most atheists that you're going to hear from online and stuff who, who don't know about it. Most people who you just get into random arguments on the side of the street that say the Bible contradicts itself, the 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 dates and kings are just hopelessly lost. Those people. This this one individual has has done so much to move us forward, proving that the dates in the Bible are historical. That it's just beyond. It, it I can't express in words how much we are indebted to this one person. So let's look at some of the examples um, that he wasn't able to resolve 100 years ago, but I will offer you my opinion, and you can do with it what thou wilt. 2 Kings um, chapter 25, verse 8 is a account that is repeated again in Jeremiah, but the dates don't add up. They say almost the same thing, but they say it um, happened on different days. So 2 Kings 25.8 says this. 
In the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, that was the nineteenth year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the bodyguard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. Okay, now, the same event, apparently, in Jeremiah... Fifty two twelve says this in the fifth month on the tenth day of the month. That was not, uh, the nineteenth year of King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, <coughs> Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the bodyguard, who served the king of Babylon, entered Jerusalem. So there's a few different ways around this. Uh, the first is simply saying that it. The, whoever was responsible for copying the manuscripts, that there was an error made somewhere along the line? Okay. Another another thing that people usually say is maybe they just had access to records, but the records were wrong. And so therefore they recorded the, number, the date wrong. Okay, that, that's also possible. Um, there's, there's a view that I think has absolutely no historical merit to it. I think it can easily be disproven, but I will mention it to you just so you are aware. Um, possibly there were different datings of the same day. So in other words, the same day on our calendar would have been the different day according to who – basically like um, this area counts that day as actually the 7th, whereas this area counts it as the 10th. I don't find any historical basis for this. I think it's completely ridiculous, but I'm throwing it out there just so you guys are aware of it. This is my solution, which, once again, you don't have to take this for granted. I mean, for, for fact, not for granted, for fact. Um, it's possible that he came to Jerusalem on the 7th, but he didn't go into it for, for five days afterwards. Because if you notice the, notice the wording, he actually says this. In 25.8 of St. Kings, it says, In the fifth month on the seventh day, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the bodyguard, came to Jerusalem. But then in, Jer in Jeremiah 52.12, it says, Nebuchadnezzar and the captain of the bodyguard entered Jerusalem. So it's possible um, that he came to Jerusalem on the seventh day but didn't go into it until – I'm sorry, did I say five days? That would be three days. Sorry. don't know why that says five days. But he didn't go into it for three, three days later. Now, why would he have waited going in? I don't know. Maybe he was busy. Uh, maybe he was setting up final details before he went in to make sure it was safe. I mean, he was kind of not just a typical peon, so maybe he didn't want to get assassinated when he walked in. <laughs> maybe he was setting up security. Maybe he was waiting for it to be safe. I don't know. But there's a possibility right there that would, that would resolve that issue. Um, a similar issue is really is just just a few verses down, 25, 27. And in the 37th year of, of the exile of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of the month, Evil Merodach, king of ba Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, graciously freed Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from prison. So this one says it was on the 27th day, but then you get to Jeremiah 52.31, and it says, Surprise, surprise, in the 37th uh, year of the exile of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 25th day of the month. So here you have that. Um, there's a few options. The first one, obviously, being that it is a rounded number instead of a literal number. 25th being – well, it was actually the 27th, but we'll just say the 25th just to round it. Um, people do that, so it is possible. It's not outside of their own possibility. I don't think that's what happened, but it is a possibility. Then we obviously have the, the same answers that we got from the other one. Maybe there's a copyist error or maybe the records were wrong. Um, but then there's another idea here, and this is kind of similar to my idea up there. It says on the 25th day in – so Jeremiah graciously freed Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and brought him out of prison. But then Seneca king says graciously freed Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from prison. So it's possible that on the 25th day he brought him out of prison and then two days later gave him a full release. That's possible. Once again, we, we might be looking at it a little bit wrong, maybe assuming that it's the same account when it's not the same account. Maybe Jeremiah was trying to focus more on the fact that they he was becoming more lenient with them and saying Kings was just, wasn't really caring about that. They were just focusing on the fact that he got released. Would look, looking at the original wording company or not really? N not really, no.
it only takes you so far. Um, and so then there's another big problem. Now, these are the two things that Edwin Thiel was unable to answer. In a second, we're going to look at Edwin Thiel's solution to all of the problem, problem datings. We'll look at that in just a second. But before we get there, there were a few things that he mentioned. First was were those passages in Kings and Jeremiah that he wasn't able to resolve that. So I've given you a solution to the problem. Uh, the second problem that Edwin Thiel was not able to get that was a big issue is the Hezekiah problem. Now, if you read in 2 Kings 18.10, it says... Very clearly, no uncertain terms, it says, and at the end of three years, he, uh, am I, yeah, and at the end of three years, he took it in the sixth year of Hezekiah, which was the ninth year of Hosea, king of Egypt, Samaria was, a, was taken. He, so he just said right there, in the sixth year of Hezekiah, which was the ninth year of Hosea, king of Israel, here's the problem. Hezekiah didn't become king of Judah until after Israel was already fallen, Hosea was not king when Hezekiah was king. Hezekiah, I mean, Hosea was um, gotten rid of in Israel in 723 when the city fell. Hezekiah didn't become king until 715. For those of you counting, that means that there's an eight-year gap there. Yet it says here that it was in Hezekiah's sixth year which was the ninth year of Hosea. That's wrong. So this is a big problem that Edwin Thiel just said it was a mistake that just compounded, and then he shows how he thinks that that problem kind of became a problem. And I don't really agree with him. You can take his solution. His solution is that, well, I'll, look, I'll show you in just probably some other time, but um, basically that, that one of the copyists didn't understand so he moved one of the kings down, which moved the whole line down, which caused Hezekiah to be, I think it's 12 years um, off from where he actually was. I don't really agree with that solution. Um, so the steel solution, this is, this is his, his solution simplified here. They made a mistake when they were copying it, so it moved the whole chronology down. They were pretty precise, the whole rest of it. Why? It, that doesn't really make sense. To say, okay, so the so the people who copied the books of Kings, they were so precise, they got all these details right in every other area, but then they made this rather large mistake in all of King Hezekiah's reign. That doesn't really fit. It's possible, but I just don't really think that that's the most likely thing. And then there's a the problem of, is, is the book of Kings old enough to endure this kind of an issue? So basically what, what I'm saying here is, is the... Did the... Did the person who copied Kings, was it long enough after Kings was written to account for such a big error in the copying where they wouldn't have caught it? And I don't think it was. I just, I just don't think it was. Kings was written sometime probably around the 500 somewhere. So maybe like, let's say 550. And the copyist copied it you know, between there and like 300, so we're talking about the span of 200 years that got that big of a corruption, I, I don't see that as likely when all the other spots are perfectly dead on. So that means there has to be another solution, in my opinion. You could you could take Thiel's solution, that's totally fine. If King Ahaz, who was Hezekiah's father, had Hezekiah, when he was somewhere in the age range of 11 to 15, which wasn't beyond the realm of possibility, uh, Egyptian pharaohs did it all the time, so it's not like it would have been that that big of a whoa. Okay, um, if if he has he has had Hezekiah when he was somewhere in that age range, then that would mean Hezekiah would be somewhere around 10 to 13 when he became co-ruler with Ahaz. However, the person who was writing Kings wanted to show that Hezekiah was a righteous person, Ahaz was an evil person. So he wouldn't have wanted to emphasize the point, the part, the, the point that they co-ruled, because that would make it out to be like maybe he was complicit with his evil, and he wanted to kind of cause a separation. So it's possible once again, seems to me actually likely, given the way that Kings is written, that he just kind of glosses over this. 
Now we know that Ahaz was was preparing in other areas for because of different mounting political problems. You can read about it in Kings and whatnot, but it's not beyond the realm of possibility once again that he would have rushed to the idea of producing an heir, or that he would have rushed to the idea of training his heir to take up for him in case anything happened. So you know neither of those things are a real out of the question. They actually they make a lot of historical sense. So times were hectic, and it was a very sexually charged atmosphere. I've already kind of mentioned that. It may have been different in their eyes. You know, this is totally possible. And so then that would be mean that this would be how you would, how this would mean. Okay, Second Kings eighteen one. In the third year of Hoshea, son of Eli, king of Israel, Hezekiah the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign as co-heir. It doesn't say that. It just says began to reign. But we know that he didn't begin to reign in Hoshea's third year. He didn't reign until eight years after Hosea was already out of uh, – Israel was already destroyed for eight years. So if you make him co-ruler at this point, that resolves the issue because as I've shown you with the age breakdown, it fits. He would have been young, yes, but not really beyond the realm of possibility once again. Second Kings 18.2, he was 25 years old when he began to reign. Okay, so this would be when he began his sole reign after Ahaz died uh, in 7.15. Um, 7, 15, 7, 16. And he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was... At, okay, so that 29 years would be the 29 years since he became sole ruler rather than his co-rule. Now, the only issue with this is this is the opposite of how they normally do the dating in Kings. Uh, not, not an insurmountable problem, but it is something that you need to be aware of. So with that being said, that brings us to an issue called accession, okay, accession years, and another issue called dual dating. Now, once you understand these two things, all of the problems with Kings and Chronicles are resolved, and this will be the last thing I mention about the dates. Once we get into next week, you won't have to worry about droning on about dates. Um, so this takes us into Edwin Thiel's research. There are... Two systems of, record, of recording the dates of the kings. Okay, Two different systems. One is called the accession and one is called the non-accession. They're both used in the Bible. The one that was used by Persia, Babylon, and Assyria, I believe I have it on this next point, was the accession year. So the accession year is also called the post-dating. This is how this works, okay? Pay attention because this is kind of a little bit confusing. The year that the king began his reign was the king's year, but record began the first month of the next year. Okay? So let me kind of break that down. Um, Gracie becomes king, okay, today, which is June or 30th or 31st or whatever. It's something like that. 30th? Okay, June 30th. But this isn't going to count as her first year. When we get to January the 1st, 2021, that will be Gracie's first year. That's, that's the accession year or post-dating method. Babylon, Persia, and Assyria, they all use this method. Okay, But then it doesn't just stop there. There's another system of dating, which the Bible also uses this one too. <laughs> they couldn't have anything simple. It's called the non-accession year or the anti-dating. Okay? So how this works is there's no king's year. Okay? The first year is reckoned from the first day they went to the throne. So Gracie goes to the throne today. This is her first year. So obviously you see that there, right there is going to be a year off. And then depending on how the year falls – hold on. I'll explain that in just a minute. It could be up to four to six years off. Now let me explain. Hold on. That takes us to Israel's calendar. Okay. Now this <laughs> – Remember, we're having a compound problem, and I'm trying to explain it as simple as I can. <laughs> they had two different calendars. One began with the month Nisan. The other began with the month Tishri. Nisan was in the spring. Tishri was in the fall. You're seeing right now how that could affect the dating of first year. Well, if I'm counting from spring versus what if I'm counting from fall, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> Buddy, we, we now have a huge problem. And then you take it to modern calendars and you try to incorporate that over. And you'll notice how a lot of books will say uh, they began their, uh, their reign in 715-714. slash 
what does that mean? Well, it means that the calendar doesn't quite go as we count our calendar. We have a pretty simple calendar through a long series of <laughs> of uh, trial and error. I was reading about uh, the Native Americans, and they, uh, well, I believe it was the Aztecs had this calendar system where they would have some weeks that were like 13 days long. For They had two different calendars. They had a religious calendar, and then they had like a regular calendar. And on their religious calendar, they had this like 20-week thing of 13-day long weeks. Uh, and then they had, on their other calendar, they had, uh, I think it was 20 days in a month, which added up to like 18 months or something. I don't remember exactly. Anyways, they had all these different months and stuff. So <laughs> we have a much simpler calendar and we don't have two different calendars, you know, a religious calendar and a regular calendar. We don't we don't have any of that. So ours is a lot more simple. Um, but but Israel's had these two different systems. But then that takes us to the third problem that we encounter with dating. Okay, so the first one is accession year or non-accession year. The second one was Nissan or Tishri. And the third problem is called dual dating. Jeez, what a cluster cuss, okay? And this is why I don't think that they made a mistake with Hezekiah, because they got through all of these loopholes with perfect dating. And you mean to tell me that they couldn't figure out Hezekiah? Come on. I just think that that's completely ludicrous. But anyways, 1 Kings chapter 16, um, and I will give you the name of the book, but I warn you, this book is extremely deep. <laughs> it's one of those thick books. It's only like this thick, like physical thick. But when you're reading it, you just have to, ah, what? <laughs> like, it's a little frustrating. But anyways, uh, 1 Kings chapter 16, 23. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri began to reign over Israel, and he reigned for 12 years. Okay, that seems pretty straightforward, but it's not. Omri reigned for a total of 12 years. However, that 12 years doesn't include just his sole reign. It includes his sole reign plus the reign that he spent at the at when there was another king. So for some kings, it's going to be a co-ruler. For some kings, it's going to be competing kings. There's one point in the Book of Kings, we'll look at it in a couple weeks, where there were in no the northern kingdom, there were three or four kings of Israel at the same time. First Kings doesn't spell it out for you, but if you pay attention to what it's saying, that's, it's clearly saying that, and I'll, we'll get to it when we get there, but can you imagine that? Three or four different kings? That's just crazy. So, um, 12 years include his sole reign and with the rival, uh, or with the co-ruler, depending on how you, uh, which king you're talking about. So that's called dual dating. Even though it says, oh, he, he ran for 12 years, which began on the seventh year of King Asa or whatever. It's like, well, no, that's actually six years from King Asa, but 12 years in total. See what I mean? Like, it, those two numbers don't add up. He's talking about two different things, and that's called dual dating. It's very confusing. I know that. <laughs> I'm not trying to tell you it's not, it's not confusing. <laughs> I, I, I made this as, as clear as I could, but I'm telling you, it's just a confusing concept. We don't dual date. That's nonsense. If uh, President Obama became the president in this year, then that's when he became the president. And if he was president for eight years, then he was president for eight years. It's that simple. That's it. So anyways, um, so the 31st year of Asa is not the first year of Omri, but of the sole rule. So you're going to have to probably sit, sit down, read the Bible a couple times, scratch your head, do a lot of thinking, <laughs> but you'll get there eventually. It's just a difficult concept, guys. So here's the here's here's the problem here, guys. Israel started out using the non-accession year system. Then they switched to the accession year accession year system. I know. <laughs> I know. Judah started with the accession. Then they went non-accession. Then they went accession again. <laughs> so are you lost yet? <laughs> yes. It's okay, guys. It's all right. So, so uh, this is why we have errors like this one that appear, which you'll see isn't really an error. 2 Kings 9.29. 
says this, uh, In the 11th year of Joram, the son of Ahab, Ahaziah became, began to reign over Judah. So what year? 11th, right? Okay, now remember that. Hold on. Now let's go back to chapter 8, verse 25, where it says, In the 12th year of Joram, the son of Ahab. Why is there a year difference? Is the Bible wrong? No. We're, okay, so basically what's happening is, according to the one dating method, it's 11 years. According to the other one, it's 12 years. I know, right? <laughs> and if you don't believe me, um, Theo has broken it down. He has the exact dates. It all matches up to the day. The Bible is so accurate in the dates of the kings that it's scary. We thought it was wrong just because of how accurate it was. Let that blow your mind. It, the dates were recorded so accurately that we thought that they were wrong. Think about that. Wow, that, that's a cl total cluster cuss. Man, and, and if you break it down, it adds up to the very days, and it all adds up with the other um, events of the other empires around or other kingdoms around them. It all adds up. Everything fits. The only problem is we didn't understand the, the three problems here, the dual dating. That was the first little hurdle, a little surprise, a little goodie. The second thing is we didn't understand the two different calendars that they used. And then the third year is we didn't and the third problem is we didn't understand the accession and the non accession year dating. Well now, thank you, thank you, Theo. Single handedly removed this giant obstacle to seeing this and this big section of historical literature as being accurate. Which is just, to me it's just amazing. Um, and then another thing that I was gonna say about this, let me see if I remember what it was okay I don't remember what else it was but it's okay because it's already confusing enough so there's a lot of time that people spend with looking at all these different problems with the kings of Israel. And I, and I want to now that now that I've alerted you to the problem and that there has been a solution that's worked out over 100 years ago, it, it holds up to speculation. It really does. It, it stood up 100 years. It's just that people don't read it for whatever reason. So let, now let's look at the good part about kings past to trying to figure out all the dates and all that stuff, okay? We have a complete, complete list of the kings. That is an invaluable source, uh, source of, 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 of knowledge and application for us. I mean, this is just powerful stuff that we're able to do this from a historical point alone, let alone the theological blessings that we get from it. Um, we have synchronisms between the two, Israel and Judah. This happened during the year of this guy's reign. This happened during the year of, we have synchronisms. They, 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 they add them up, and, and they do the math for you. That's a just an extreme... Uh, first off, blessing, but second off, that's a lot of work they had to go through. And third off, that's just really helpful. We also ha usually have the age of accession, when, how old they were when they became king, usually. Um, we have when in the reign something happened, usually. You know, like uh, this event happened in this guy's 12th year or something. Um, we have intervals, th those are given. We have... Uh, de uh, it, it details. Um, it gives us the details recorded uh, in the Bible and extra biblical sources. Things that don't just happen in the Bible. Things that happen in the world, the real world. It gives us lists of that, so we have something to tie it into. I mean, this is just unbelievably accurate, unbelievably helpful. Um, of course, obviously, I should give a little asterisk. The Bible doesn't record everything that happened. Just the things that are important that they wanted you to know. Just so you know, it's not like we're gonna find like. A complete record of uh, Egypt in the Bible. We're not going to find that because it wasn't really important for what he was trying to write for. So, don't 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 go telling people that it records everything that happened in the world. It didn't record everything that happened in the world. Um, okay, synchronism synchronisms between the Jewish kings and the other kings. Like it'll say, um, this king was king when King Nebuchadnezzar did this. It, it ties that in too, so it gives us an accurate uh, record. So if you are interested in this book, I once again warn you, it is, it is agonizing at parts, guys. It is, it is frustrating, but uh, we are deeply in debt to this, uh, this amazing, amazing book. Uh, it's by Edwin Thiel. It's called The Mysterious Numbers of the Hebrew Kings, and mysterious they are, as you've seen. Uh, his name's Edwin Thiel, um, and in the book, he gives a king-by-king -king breakdown Full explanation of the dates and all that stuff. 
Um, like I said, his only thing is he he uh, he did not resolve the Hezekiah problem. Um, he just simply said that it was a problem with uh, the copyists that the Bible just records it wrong. I don't think that the Bible recorded it wrong. I think that it was. I think that Hezekiah became a co-ruler at a very uh, young age because Ahaz was extremely worried about politics. Um, I, I really genuinely think that. Um, and one thing, oh, I remember what I was going to say on that one thing where it said in the eleventh year, and another part it said in the twelfth year. That was actually at the at the right at the time when they were switching from the or from the non-accession calendar to the other calendar. So it's interesting that that's right where that eleven twelve mark is at, right when they were switching the calendar over. <laughs> another another point of how accurate it is. I mean, how crazy is that? That they were in the middle of a, of a calendar switch. I mean, that just that blows my mind. Blows my mind. Anyways, uh, so are there any questions? Please say no. No. <laughs> How come he didn't come up with the whole um, co reign thing? Did they not have that knowledge back then? Um, because uh, the it's it's back. Um, how it records King Hezekiah is backwards from how it records all the other kings. Uh -huh. It says it, it, the dual dating thing. It doesn't do that, and it does that with the other ones, and it just does the opposite on King Hezekiah. So that that's a problem if you think that they have to stick to the m m uh, model like. Seal thought they had to stick with the model. They couldn't. There couldn't be any variations. I don't think so. I think they could have, for numerous reasons. Uh, maybe they were drawing upon two different uh, sources. For instance, um, maybe for instance they were making copies and they were using this, and they're like, okay, well Hezekiah is recorded in more detail on this one, so they will go over to this other source and they're, you know, see what I mean? There, things could have things could have happened, um, or maybe they were trying to make it. Um, Maybe they were trying to draw attention to the fact that Hezekiah was a breath of fresh air in the midst of evil kings. Mm -hmm. he was, maybe they were trying to draw attention to that, so they purposely did, did that. Um, another thing is, um, well, there's there's lots of different things that yeah. could have been theological and historical. Yeah. Okay. So, any other questions? No? Okay. Thank God, guys, because, man, it was hard enough just studying for this kind of stuff. Oh my gosh! <laughs>